It is now time for a question period. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, the Privacy Commissioner yesterday said that the, the destruction of emails by senior officials within the Premier's office and Minister of Energy was the most serious case she'd investigated in her 15-year career. In her conclusion, she notes, and I quote, ignorance is no excuse. Transparency of government activities reflected in their records is essential to freedom and liberty, quote. She also noted that government information has been removed and put on external USB drives. Speaker, it's been stolen from the legislature. Premier, the law has been broken, and we've requested today that the OPP launch an investigation. Will you agree with us and instruct your Attorney General to launch a police investigation into the deletion of emails Thank by you. senior Liberal staffers? Thank you. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, it is the, members op the member opposite's prerogative to ask whatever he chooses, Mr. Speaker. I have said that I am uh, very grateful that Dr. Kavukian has written her report, Mr. Speaker. We're examining her findings. Oh. And I agree with her conclusions, Mr. Speaker, that this should not have happened. I am committed. I have order. Committed, I have committed to making changes to ensure that all staff the member are from Halton, come to order. The member from Halton come to order, the member from Leeds Grenville come to order, and the member from Prince Edward Hastings come to order. The member from Durham come to order. Who's next? Finish, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it's not my want to respond to heckling, but the member reality from is that the, come to order. the heckling from across the floor that you know, this is no big deal. It is a big deal, Mr. Speaker. It's a very serious deal, it, and that is why we have taken action, Mr. Speaker. I agree with the Thank conclusions you. of the Privacy Commissioner. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Premier. The Privacy Commissioner relayed shocking details on the activities of Craig McLennan the former Chief of Staff at the Energy Ministry, and David Livingston, the former Chief of Staff to former Premier McGuinty. Livingston asked the Secretary of Cabinet in January how to, quote, wipe clean the hard drives in the Premier's office, quote. She said, quote, during our meeting with Livingston, we learned that his information practices were very similar to those of McLennan. He also, he also deleted his emails daily. There was a systematic liberal attempt to thwart the democratic and legal rights of members of this legislature and to make sure those documents never Question. saw the light of day. Premier, there, there are grounds for a police investigation here. Will you join us and have your Attorney General request a formal police investigation into this crime? Thank you. Premier? Thank very much, Mr. Speaker. Since I have been in this role, there has been a Minister systematic and intentional attempt to provide every piece of information that is available, that is asked for, and that is what we've been doing, Mr. Speaker. We have trained staff. We have put in place a clear directive that all the rules will be followed, that all the information will be made available, Mr. Speaker. I agree with Dr. Kabukian's conclusions. This should not have happened. We are going to make changes to make sure to make sure that it can't happen again, Mr. Speaker. And in the interim, we have already taken actions to make sure that everyone is retaining the information that they need to, and beyond that, Mr. Speaker, making sure that information that has been Answer. asked for, that is relevant to the discussion at the Justice Committee, has been provided to the tune of 130,000 documents, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, you say you've put in a systematic and intentional uh, 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 system in place. But you are personally responsible yes, for leading and continuing a culture of secrecy that puts Liberal Party interests ahead of those in Ontarians. You talk about training your staff in retention, but let's talk about using uh, non-FOIable Gmails. We've provided evidence in this House that you and your transition team leader 
have used private Gmail accounts to conduct government business in a deliberate attempt to subvert freedom of information laws. The Privacy Commissioner says the law has been broken Minister here. She said, the quote, there was a culture order. of avoiding the Question. creation of written documentation on the gas plant issue. And you're still carrying that on by using secret Gmails account, uh, Gmail accounts. Premier, will you stand Thank here you. today and join our party in asking for a police investigation into this cover-up? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The OPP are independent, and they will do what they uh, they deem best. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite has those emails. Mr. Speaker, they are not secret because the member opposite has them. He has access to them. We have provided access to them at every turn, at every question. We have re we have provided the information that the members opposite have asked for. Mr. Speaker, that's why we brought the mandate. The member from Simcoe Gray, Scott, the member from uh, Wellington Hall Hills, the member from Thornhill, the member from Oxford, thank you. Finish, please. Much, Mr. Speaker. That's why we broadened the mandate. We wanted the mandate of the Justice Committee to be broadened so that all of the questions could be asked, so that people could be brought before the committee and all of the, that investigation that the committee wanted to do could take place. We have provided 130,000 documents, 30,000 from my office, Mr. Speaker. We have put training in place. We are doing everything in our power to make sure that all the rules Answer. are followed and all the information is available, including the information that the, uh, the member opposite is referring to, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. New question, the member from Nepean, Carleton. Is also to the Premier. Yesterday, we learned from the most, uh, that, that the most senior officials in the Premier's office copied government emails and documents related to the gas plant scandal onto personal drives and then ordered that that information and those documents and that evidence be destroyed. I'm going to read Section 122 of the Criminal Code of Canada, the Breach of Trust. Every official who, in connection with the duties of his office, commits fraud or breach of trust is guilty of an indictable offence and liable to imprisonment for a term not exceeding five years, whether or not the fraud or breach of trust would be an offence if it were committed in relation to a private, per private uh, person. Premier, you have no choice other than to call in the OPP to Question. investigate Dalton McGuinty's former office and your office for this crime. Will you do it? You see it? I'd like to ask the member of Oxford, how's your hand? Is it okay? Take it. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I've said, the OPP is an independent body and they will do what they uh, deem uh, in the best interests of the people of Ontario to do. Um, I am I'm very pleased that Dr. Kabukian has uh, issued this report, Mr. Speaker. I agree with her conclusions. I agree, Mr. Speaker, that there need to be changes made, and I agree, Mr. Speaker, that, that there needs to be action taken, some of which we have already begun, Mr. Speaker, but we will continue to work with the Privacy Commissioner uh, to make sure that the changes that are necessary are made so that this won't happen again. I agree it shouldn't have happened, which is why, Mr. Speaker, from the the day that I've been in this office, I have worked to open up this process to make sure that all of the information that was asked Answer. for would be available. The reason that the members opposite are asking these questions, Mr. Speaker, one of the reasons is that they have the information that we have provided, because that is the right thing Thank to do, you. Mr. Speaker. I find this troubling. The minister, the premier says we are going to do better, we need to do better in the future, and they keep saying that. They said that about eHealth. They said that about Orange. And let's talk about Orange for a moment. You say that the OPP should uh, do what's in the best interest of the province. Minister of the Environment. The Minister of Health, who actually called the OPP in to investigate Orange. Why don't you speak to your Deputy Premier Minister? Why don't you talk about Good the point. officials in your government who copied data onto personal drives and then destroyed the evidence? That's why the OPP needs to be called in right now. That 
That is why Section 341 of the Criminal Code applies here. Fraudulent concealment. Everyone who, for a fraudulent purpose, takes, obtains, removes, or conceals anything is guilty of an indictable offence and liable for imprisonment for two, a term not exceeding Question. two years. Speaker, would they do it in Orange because it didn't affect them directly? Why won't they do it here? This minister, this Order. premier, and the former premier are guilty of a crime. I'm uh, stop the clock, please. I, I am going to uh, make a comment about that last statement. That uh, I believe that those kinds of uh, that kind of language is uh, uh, has. I, I'm bothered by it, and I would ask the member to uh, guard her questions very carefully. And I will be listening carefully to see that it's not done again. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I will just say again that we have done absolutely everything possible to make sure that every piece of information, every question that has been asked, every person who has been asked to come, that all of that has been made available to the members opposite, Mr. Speaker, and to the public. Because I have said repeatedly that what happened in terms of the relocation of the gas plants should not have happened. There should have been a better process up front. And to the issue of uh, making changes so that none of this would happen again. We have already begun that process. So the the uh, privacy commissioner acknowledges that we have done training, Mr. Speaker. We have made it clear to staff what the rules are. We will continue to do that. And as more questions are asked, Mr. Speaker, we will continue as yes, we sir. began, and that is to provide the information that is asked for by the, the committee and by the members opposite. Two final supplementary. Speaker, they have breached the public archives law that they put in place. They have breached Section 122 of the Criminal Code. They have breached Section 341 of the Criminal Code. They called in the OPP when it was convenient on Orange. Why won't they call in the White Collar Crime Unit of the OPP here today? Is it because the Kathleen Wynn, O Wynn, Kathleen O Wynn at Gmail account is in suspect? Is it because they've been trading information that they don't want the public to see so they can continue to skirt FOI requests? Mr. Speaker, this is very serious. If the Premier cannot stand in her place today and look at the public in Ontario and tell them that she will do what's right for them, then we are in trouble as a democracy in this province. They have probably broken the law more than once. The Information Privacy Commissioner said as much Question. yesterday. I ask her once again, on behalf of the residents of this province and the people of this province, will she stand in her place, call in the white collar crime Thank you. of the OPP? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, it is a first principle of mine that I will follow the law, yes. I will follow the rules, yes. and I will make sure that everyone who works for me, Mr. Speaker, works with me, follows the law, and follows the rules, and I take Complete, please. And, Mr. Speaker, since I have been in elected office before I was in this House, when I was a school trustee, I have followed the rules, Mr. Order, Speaker. Please. I have taken advice at every turn. Order, when please. I came into this office, I opened up this Member process Durham, on the come to order. of the relocation of the gas plants so that all of the questions could be answered. Member from we have come to order. place in our office, Mr. Speaker. Answer. We have turned over documents. We will continue to ask, answer the questions that are asked of us, Mr. Thank Speaker. Your question, the member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker to the Premier. It was last November that New Democrats raised the fact that documents related to so-called Project Vapor had gone missing from the Premier's office. When this new Premier was sworn in, did she ask why these emails were missing? 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. What I did when I came into this office is I made sure that we knew what the rules were, Mr. Speaker, that we put training in place, that we made it clear to everyone who worked in the uh, Premier's office and across Order. government understood about the retention of information and that the rules were followed. That's what I did when I came into this office, Mr. Speaker. In her first week on the job here in the Legislature, I asked the Premier where these missing emails were and what was being done to find them. The Premier could have stood in her place and said that I have serious concerns. She could have taken action. Instead, she bounced the question to the House Leader. If the Premier was genuinely concerned about Liberal staffers deleting emails and breaking the law, why didn't she do anything to help find them? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think the member opposite knows that uh, at that point we were very much engaged in what the procedures were going to be, how the committees were going to be structured, exactly what the process was going to be, because we were committed to opening up the process and making sure that all of the questions got answered and that there was a process in place for that kind of openness to take place. I was taking action in our office, Mr. Absolutely. Speaker. We made sure that all the rules were followed from the day that I came in, and we have provided information as it has been asked for, Mr. Speaker. 130,000 documents, 30,000 documents from our office, and we will continue to behave in that manner, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. The fact is, the Premier had a chance to offer some change. She could have said, This deletion of emails is wrong, this wiping out of records is wrong, this is possibly illegal, and I'm not going to stand for it. She could have asked the tough questions of the staff, of the bureaucrats. Instead, she offered more of the same. If the Premier thought the Liberal government shouldn't have deleted those emails, why didn't she come clean, clean at the time and simply say, this is wrong? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think my actions speak very clearly by making it clear that we were going to retain information as required, that all the rules were going to be followed. Mr. Speaker, that's exactly, I think, in response to the, the member's question. That's what we did. We, we made it clear to staff. We, we put training in place. We made it very clear that we were going to be following every rule and making sure that all information that needed to be retained was retained, Mr. Speaker. I agree with the conclusions of the Privacy Commissioner. We will continue to work with her to make, that, to make sure that further changes that are necessary are made so that this cannot happen again, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Your question? We're from Toronto Danforth. To the Premier again. Yesterday, Ontario's Information and Privacy Commissioner confirmed what New Democrats have been saying for a long time, that the Liberals were destroying information about the gas plants. It's clear that we need to do more to get answers that people deserve. Will the Premier agree to a full public inquiry to get to the bottom of this? So, Mr. Speaker, I know that the House Leader will want to speak to the uh, supplementary, but I, I just want to be clear. We have, as I have said, we agree, I agree with the conclusions of the Privacy Commissioner. I agree that this shouldn't have happened. I agree, Mr. Speaker, that there may be further changes that need to be made. But just, just to be Again, crystal clear, we have already begun making changes, Mr. Speaker. We began the day that I came into office. We have put training in place. We've made it clear to staff in the Premier's office and across government that uh, information that is to be retained is retained and that any questions that need to be answered in terms of the relocation of the gas plants, that we provide that relevant information. That's Answer. what we've been doing. That's how we began. That's how we will continue, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker to the Premier, the Justice Committee is doing important work, but Liberal members continue to call witnesses who were not involved with the cancellation of the gas plants and can't tell us how much of the people's money the Liberal government wasted for its own political gain. Will the Premier do the right thing and call an independent public inquiry? Mr. Speaker, 
Mr. Speaker, the Justice Committee mandate was broadened at the request of the Premier. Mr. Speaker, they can undertake an examination into any aspect of this situation, including the documents. The Honourable Member mentions Liberal witnesses. Well, Mr. Speaker, most of the Liberal witnesses have been Conservative Party candidates who were out with robocalls and pamphlets, knocking on doors saying, vote for us and the gas plant will be done, done, done. Mr. Speaker, to my friend in the New Democrat, Democratic Party, I cannot help it that progressive conservative candidates are being told not to show up at the committee, Mr. Speaker, but we're going to continue to call them because they are part of a very, very relevant piece of this puzzle. Thank you. Supplementary. Final, final supplementary. Well, Speaker, nothing says evasion like bouncing a question to the House Leader. <laughs> the Premier. The Premier has said she wants to be transparent. If the Premier is so committed to openness and transparency, will she call a public inquiry into the gas plant scandal, the waste of public money, and the fact that senior Liberals were destroying information that belongs to the public? Let me talk about transparency, Mr. Speaker. I mentioned some of the actions of the Premier in broadening the mandate of the committee. If the member wants to talk about the information in Privacy Commissioner's report, let me quote from what she said, what was said on the news last night. CFTO. The Commissioner has praise for the new Premier, saying Kathleen Wynne has been proactive. Let me quote from the IPC report. Throughout this entire investigation, my office received the full cooperation of all parties involved, including the Premier's office, that's the current Premier, Cabinet office, the MGS, current and former staff and the Minister of Energy's office, and the Archives of Ontario question. staff. I appreciate the time taken and the information provided by these offices and by individual staff staff as part of this investigation. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has taken concrete steps to address this issue, and she has asked me as Minister of Government Services to continue to see how we can strengthen the Act. I will be meeting with the Information and Privacy Commissioner shortly. New question? The member from Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think the transparency that Ontarians want is an election, Mr. Speaker, and my question is to the Premier. The member from Nipissing and I have drafted a letter asking the OPP to investigate your government's actions in relation to the deletion of emails surrounding the Oakvale and Mississauga power plant scandal. I'll lay your options out for you, you Premier. You can show some contrition and leadership by talking to us today, or you can speak with the police regarding your government's illegal uh, tactics. Your agenda of openness and transparency has been a farce Shameful. from the start. And the mere fact that you choose those words to describe your government shows how little respect you have for the people of this province. So, Premier, since you won't acknowledge any wrongdoing Question. on that side of the aisle, we at least get out of the way when the OPP comes to your office to get to the bottom of this scandal on behalf of the people Thank of Ontario. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, as I've said, the OPP is an independent body. The OPP uh, will do what they choose to do, Mr. Speaker. But if the member opposite is suggesting that if there were a question asked Black of me nine. by the OPP, would I respond, Mr. Speaker? Um, you know, I take offence at the suggestion that I would not. Uh, I absolutely would. I would absolutely comply with anything that I was asked to do, Mr. Speaker, by the police. And I think, I think the member opposite actually knows that, Mr. Speaker. So, as I say, we have worked very hard to provide the information that he and the other members have asked for, Mr. Speaker. We opened up the process. We will continue as we began, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, providing the information that is relevant to the uh, to the questioning of the Justice Committee, we will continue to do that. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I take great offence that this government continues to hide the truth from the people of Ontario. You should. Um, I'm going to ask the member to withdraw because that uh, is saying something that uh, in the back door you can't say in the front door. So will you please withdraw? The withdrawal, Mr. Speaker. You stood here in this House talking about instilling accountability, and a week later, a report comes out saying how your government deleted accountability from the people of Ontario. Shameful. Premier, the irony would be laughable if it weren't so shockingly expensive. I quote from the report. 
Without a written record of how key government decisions are made, the government can avoid disclosure and public scrutiny as to the basis and reasons for its actions. You've been in that chair for almost four months and have yet to Question. show any shred of accountability. This is the best place to start. Will you right now, Premier, order your staff to get us the USB sticks and make the information public before they disappear quicker than the hard drives they came from? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Premier. Leader. Speaker, the, the, uh, the, the member talks about documents. Let's talk about documents. 130,000 documents have been provided to the committee, 30,000 of them from the Premier's office. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about the Premier's commitment to transparency. When she was made Premier, one of her, her first actions, Order. Mr. Speaker, was asking the Auditor General to look into the Oakville situation. After that, Mr. Speaker, she offered the opposition a select committee to look into the gas plant uh, situation, and they said no because they wanted to have a witch hunt against a former member. But, Mr. Speaker, she wasn't, she wasn't held back by that. She, worked to, she asked me to work with the opposition so that we could broaden the mandate of the committee. She has appeared in front of the committee. She has uh, encouraged staff and ministers to appear in front of the committee. Mr. Speaker, she has been forthcoming, as I said Answer. in the previous question. She has been forthcoming with the Information and Privacy Commissioner, and she has taken every step to make sure rules are being followed and asked me Thank to you. look at how we can strengthen those rules. Thank you. New question, the member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is the Premier. Premier, Ontarians want to know why the government wasted over a billion dollars of their money uh, to cancel gas plants. They want to know why the government thought they could get away with destroying key information. Order. Today, stop the clock. Member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, come to order. Carry on. Today, New Democrats moved that the Justice Committee keeps sitting through the entire summer. Can the Premier explain why the Liberal members voted with the PCs to put their summer vacation plans ahead of getting answers for Ontarians? Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, there's a certain irony in that question. The fact that the committee has full control of its own agenda, Mr. Speaker, is because the Premier of this province offered to have a broad mandate of the committee that it would, in, in parliamentary parlance, sit at the call of the chair. The Premier has in no way tried to hamper the committee's investigations. She has appeared in front of the committee, and under her watch, we have given 130,000 pages of documents to the committee, including 30,000 from the Premier's office. Mr. Speaker, the control of the Justice Committee is in the hands of the members, Mr. Speaker, which I think is a tribute to the transparency of this yes, Premier. Thank you. Supplementary. Premier, Ontarians deserve answers about the gas plant scandal. New Democrats have called for an independent public inquiry, but the government has dug in its heels. Then we called for the Justice Committee to keep th sitting through the entire summer to get down to the answers. But this government joined with the PCs and dug in their heels again. They're more concerned with working on their golf handicap than working to find the truth. Why did the Liberal members vote against more transparency and against getting Ontarians the answers that they deserve. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure if I'm the only one that finds it finds it amusing that the NDP are now accusing the government of some conspiracy with the PCs to cover up the gas plant situation, Mr. Speaker. I think that's a little bit too rich for this side of the legislature. The fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker, is that the Justice Committee, with a broadened mandate, was set up, Mr. Speaker, with the support and encouragement of this Premier. We have provided it with 130,000 documents. Those documents have been forthcoming, Mr. Speaker, as requests have come forward. We have seen this Premier, when she took office, write a letter to the Auditor General asking him to look into the Oakville situation, and we're expecting his report later this summer. Mr. Speaker, this Premier has gone to great lengths to make sure that our government is as transparent yes, as sir. possible. And as I say, going forward, she has asked me, as Minister of Government Services, to see ways that we can strengthen the current laws as outlined in the Thank IPC's you. report. Question? Member from Scarborough Southwest. 
My question is for the Minister of Finance. A few weeks ago, there was a passionate debate at Toronto City Council about converting the proposed Scarborough LRT into a subway. Many of my constituents in Scarborough Southwest have been trying to convert this project into a subway for some time and have supported this change for many years. I know that you've recently had correspondence with the Federal Minister of Finance, Jim Flaherty, about receiving more funding from the federal government on transit. The province of Ontario has committed $8.4 billion in capital investments, which is covering the cost of the Eglinton, Scarborough, Shepherd, and Finch projects. The federal government has a measly $330 million, not billion, but million dollars, allocated for the Shepherd project. I can see why this question needs to be updated. What are the circumstances around which aspects of the big move that could be revisited? Great question. Thank you, Minister, uh, Minister Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to thank the member from uh, Scarborough Southwest for his passionate advocacy on this very important issue. Currently, there is no plan to revisit these projects. They are founded on a plan with Metrolinx that is based on legal agreements signed in November with the City of Toronto, the TTC, and they are acting on that plan. However, it is unfortunate that the federal government has not established a dedicated transit fund. If the federal government was at the table with their complete share of the funds needed to support transit expansion, then aspects of the big move could be revisited. This issue is simply too important for us to take a wait-and-see approach to federal funding when we must act now to address the congestion crisis in the DTHA. Federal infrastructure funding should be flexible so provinces and other partners Absolutely. can maintain a path to fiscal balance and support our economy and communities Answer. through strategic infrastructure investments. The governments must be aligned with the federal investment strategy so that these priorities and strategic investments can be had. Thank you. And as you know, Mr. Speaker, I've been inviting the federal government. And thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for providing that update. And I agree it is truly unfortunate that the federal government has not come to the table yet with a national strategy on transit. Other developed countries provide much greater federal funding for transit projects, and Canada is lagging behind its counterparts significantly. Mr. Speaker, our government's record on public transit investment is truly something to be proud of. Our budget, 2013, outlined several key investments in public transit that we hope will be passed with support of all parties in the House. We have stepped up to build transit across the province, and we are already seeing results. Speaker, the minister mentioned investments across the GTHA and beyond in public transit. Could the minister update us Question. on the other projects that are part of the budget 2013 plan? Thank you, Minister of Finance. Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, wa I want to be very clear about a few things here. One, we have a memorandum of understanding with the City of Toronto, which they voted for. They voted down subways in Scarborough, and then they changed their mind, and then we went back, and the Premier, when she was Minister of Transportation, with, with skill that I could, think could solve the Middle East crisis, renegotiated, brought that back, and we have a deal. We've had a deal not once, Mr. Speaker, but twice. The federal government, the door was always open to them to come in. They didn't. The city council could come to the federal and provincial governments and say, we would like another MOU because we would like to add projects, and for the first time, we'd like to write a big check. The federal government could Answer. come to us, Mr. Speaker, and say, we would like to join because you're paying 90 percent of the cost. We don't think that's fair. We think we're being kind of cheap at 5 percent. We'll come up with maybe 25 percent, and Thank then you. anything's possible, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Thank you. Your question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier this morning. Premier, this just keeps getting worse and worse every day. I'm sick of watching all the Premier's men unravel here in the legislature as this scandal continues to reach further and further into the Liberal, uh, liberal organization. And now we've even got the NDP who are guilty as well for aiding and abetting this criminal activity by continuing to support this government. They're guilty of being an accessory after the fact. You claim to be innocent. You've used your private Gmail account to discuss the gas plants because you know it wouldn't be subject to freedom of information. We've had your transition chief, Manick Smith, on record insulting a ruling by our speaker. We've had two senior Liberal chiefs of staff 
break the law to destroy documents. Premier, at least when Richard Nixon was breaking the law, he had the decency to resign as the evidence was mounting. He had the decency to resign in that scandal. Show some respect for the office that you hold. You. Show some respect for the people of Ontario. You. Will you call in the open meeting today? Uh, while the uh, clock is stopped, I am going to recognize that this is a heated debate, but uh, I am uh, a little concerned about the direction in the verbiage that's being used to make accusations against members. Uh, I would prefer the questions to be direct uh, away from that as much as possible. Premier. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as I have said a few times in the House, the OPP is an independent from entity, the and, and Carlton to, uh, come to order. they deem uh, in, the, in the best interest of the people of Ontario. Uh, I have said again, Mr. Speaker, that since I came into this office, I have worked to make sure that all the information that was asked for was provided. That's the right. fact is, Mr. Speaker, that the member opposite is talking about an email that he has. It's an email that he has read. It's an email that he has in his hands. So clearly, Mr. Speaker, it's not something that I was trying to keep secret because he has it in his hands, Mr. Speaker, and that is completely consistent with what we have done since I came into this role, Mr. Speaker. We've opened up the process. We've provided the information that was asked for. We will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the Privacy Commissioner ruled yesterday or this week that that Liberal government was guilty of breaking the law. It's as simple as that. And who is the leader of that Liberal government? It's the Premier of the province. I'm not interested in more talking points, and neither are the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. They want to see some real action. I'm interested in the Premier. That's you, finally, showing some respect for the office that you hold. The Chief of Staff to your predecessor broke the law. The former Chief of Staff to the Minister of Energy broke the law. Senior members of your team have said in emails that they don't really see any problem with that. They've actually stood up and said that they don't see any problem with breaking the law. This is about a fundamental breach of trust that you and your senior members of your party and your government have committed against the people of Ontario. Only the OPP's white-collar crime unit can get Question. to the bottom of this scandal. Will you, like Richard Nixon, have to be escorted out of here to make that happen? Let's get Thank the you. bottom of this. Bring in the OPP. Investigate this scandal. Premier. Government House Leader. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm very interested in the honourable member's uh, discussion of the use of personal Gmail accounts. Mr. Speaker, they'll want to hear this. I'd like to I'd like to read an email into the record. It says a great opportunity has come up. You've been asked to do Focus Ontario this week. Taping is tomorrow at 2 p.m. and they want to give you the whole show. You'll be on with John Tory and Keith Leslie. The time works for your schedule, so we're going to book it in, and you've got some time before that to do a bit of prep. It's signed Lynette Harris, executive assistant to the leader of the opposition. But the, most, the most interesting thing, Mr. Speaker, it's sent to the leader of the opposition at his Gmail account, Mr. Speaker. No question. The member from London Central. Order. Order. Order, please. Order, please. Order, please. This is the time in which you don't know whether or not I'm going to uh, take another step if it gets quiet and you decide you're going to interject. New question, the member from London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Health Minister of Long-Term Care. Speaker, in London and Middlesex County, 68 per cent, or 15 out of 22 long-term care homes have not had an annual resident quality inspection. The minister's response has been extremely concerning, implying that complaints or critical incident investigations can take the place of thorough and preventative inspections. 
Will the minister acknowledge that the 15 homes in Middlesex County investigated for complaints and critical incidents should still get a full inspection so that further tragedies can be prevented? Thank you, Minister of Health and Welfare. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, I completely agree that when people uh, are in long term care homes, uh, they and their loved ones ought to have confidence in the quality of care that is being delivered in those long term care homes. Uh, we are significantly strengthening, Speaker, the inspection protocol since 2010. We are, uh, we are, our inspections are much more thorough than they are resident focused. Is there more to do, Speaker? Yes, I believe there is more to do, and I am exploring what those options might be. Thank you, supplementary. Speaker, some long-term care homes in London have more than two dozen investigations following a complaint or critical incident. The frequency of these complaint investigations might point to an underlying problem. But still, the minister has not taken the time to do a full inspection. Right. Seniors in long-term care and their families want problems resolved before they turn to tragedy. Will the minister tell these families when full inspections of all long-term care homes will be completed? Thank you, minister. Well, Speaker, I think it is important to, to note that every home does receive a, um, an inspection every year. In fact, last year the ministry undertook 2,347 inspections. That's an average of 3.7 inspections per home. Speaker, I think it's also important to talk about the real improvements in quality that are happening in our long-term care homes since the introduction and implementation of our new Long-Term Care Act. Uh, speaker, at, um, I'll just speak about one home at uh, Leisure Word, Tullamore, a 50 per cent reduction in critical incidents because of the work that's being done through Behavioural Supports Ontario. Speaker, the behaviours are decreasing because staff is better trained to know how to deal with people who have significant behavioural challenges. Improving the quality of care is the, is the highest priority in our long-term care home. Speaker. Inspections are Answer. part of that. As I said before, we are looking at how to even further strengthen those uh, long-term care inspections. Thank you. New question? A member from Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Speaker, uh, my riding of Mississauga East Cooksville has a large number of high-rises, and so the ongoing elevator strike is of issue, and I've been getting quite a few emails and calls from concerned constituents. Here's an example of a concern a constituent a constituent email to me. There are three elevators in the building of 30 floors and only one elevator is operational. There's a message saying the technicians are on strike. I, as a homemaker, am asking for your assistance in solving this very severe issue. Can the Minister of Labour give us an update on the negotiations that are taking place? Mr. Labor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. I want to thank the, uh, the member for a very important question, and I do uh, sympathize with the concern that her constituent has raised. I've received, obviously, similar emails uh, from my constituency, I'm sure other members as well. This is definitely an issue that impacts, uh, Speaker, all Ontarians. I want to assure the House that the Ministry of Labor is, is quite engaged. In fact, the Ministry of Labor mediator has met. Uh, the parties, uh, both the parties at 10 different uh, occasions and is avail available to assist the parties at the bargaining table whenever requested. Uh, speaker, we urge both parties to come back to the table and resume negotiations. Uh, I'm very confident that by working together, the parties will be able uh, to get uh, to reach a settlement and we know settlements reached at the negotiating uh, tables are the best one and the, and the sustainable one. I also understand, Speaker, that repairs can continue by qualified TSSA certified uh, personnel, which uh, uh, various buildings and our constituencies can avail to. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for, this, uh, for his update on how the negotiations are going, as well as for clarifying that while the strike is on, elevator, elevators can continue to be repaired. I'd just like some clarification on behalf of my con constituents as to how they would know whether a elevator repair person is a certified licensed repair person while the strike is going on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minister, Speaker, Minister of Consumer Services. Wow. Sir, Consumer Services. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. First, I want to inform all members of the House that it is the responsibility of building management and the owners to work with service providers to pre repair the elevator speaker. In the interest of protecting public safety, the Technical Safety and Standards Authority, the TSSA, requires that only certified and qualified technicians work to repair the elevators. Currently, Speaker, there are managers, supervisors, and other certified personnel who have the required certifications to work on elevators. So repairs are being done, Speaker, however, not as quickly as many would like, of course. With regard to emergency situations, buildings have their own plan, Speaker, to respond to situations with emergency responders. It's important to note that the TSA has zero tolerance for situations where uncertified, unqualified personnel are found to be working on elevators. I'm monitoring this very closely, Thank and you. TSSA and myself will act on public Thank safety you. risks as we Thank you. New question? The member from Perth, Wellington. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to the member from um, Huron, Bruce. Mr. Speaker, my question today is for the Premier. Premier, I'm going to quote from your throne speech this past February. Your government intends to work with municipalities on other issues, too, so that local populations are involved from the beginning if there's going to be a gas plant or a casino or a wind plant or a quarry. Premier, I'm now going to quote you and quote 104.9 The Beach from Godrich this past Saturday. During a visit to Sarnia Friday, Premier Wynne, when asked about the May 30th announcement, told reporters that municipalities who have made declarations of unwilling host committee or com communities are likely out of luck. Mm -hmm. Premier, your attitude towards rural Ontario is criminal, yeah. but sadly, that's become the norm of your government, I'm afraid. Yeah, I but going so. back to unwilling host communities who have declared Question. in writing that they're unwilling, Premier, I have to ask you, do you or do you not support these municipalities? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, of course, it's always best uh, for uh, parties uh, to work cooperatively with municipalities. I have a tremendous example of one right here, Mr. Speaker, uh, and this is uh, uh, from the uh, member from Nipissing when he was mayor. And perhaps we should take his lead, and municipalities might take his lead. Taking advantage of locally available green power resources is a good fit with the long-range development strategy we have for the community. I am particularly pleased with the relationship we have struck with West Wind Development, Inc. for the first half of the project. I am confident that the company's reputation as a responsible wind power developer can put North Bay on the map as a showcase for the sensitive and responsible development Answer. of this great renewable energy resource, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Minister, you and I both know that's nothing but a load of spin. And back to the Premier. Municipalities know your support is fair weathered. Proponents that I've met with, municipalities and all of us in the PC caucus, are wondering why this last week's announcement was made before your MPP working group has actually even gotten together and presented recommendations as reported in August. Premier, it's yep. an insult to rural yep. Ontario. Yep. Municipalities no thought that they could expect better from you. You told them they could, but you instead think you can fool them with this announcement, and actually they know better. They're very savvy now. They know it means nothing. Yep. Who did your working group decide with? Because I can tell you, no one in my riding heard from anybody. Because of that, Premier, will you invite opposition like myself and other members impacted by industrial wind turbines to join your working group so we Thank can you. do the right thing? You see it, please? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I assure you that the decibel level doesn't necessarily create any more substance to the reality of the situation. Mr. Speaker, community spoke. The member from Leeds, Grenville, will come to order, and I'm going to ask that all members allow the answer to be put. Uh, the member from Leeds, Grenville, is looking for a warning. He's got one. You are warned. 
Mr. Speaker, community spoke, mayor spoke, and we listened. We listened. We, we uh, consulted with the Association of Municipalities for, of, of Ontario in a very significant way. We listened to stakeholders, Mr. Speaker. For these large renewable projects, Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Power Authority is creating a new bidding process where priority approval is given to projects that have prior municipal approval, exactly. making it extremely difficult, if not impossible, Mr. Speaker, for contracts to be awarded without an arrangement with a municipality. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, we're creating funds for municipalities, small and medium-sized municipalities, so they can create answer. municipal energy plans. And Mr. Speaker, we're creating more taxation uh, availability for uh, municipalities that have wind Thank turbines, you. Mr. Speaker. It's very Thank significant you. and substantial. New question, the member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Labour. Minister, on Tuesday, 400 retirees of National Auto Rad in Windsor learned that they will lose their health and life insurance benefits. The reason is the employer is filing for bankruptcy and has cleverly manipulated things so that all liquidated assets will be going to another company. A sister company, get this, owned by the same family that owns National Auto Rad. Why is this government doing nothing when 400 loyal Windsor retirees are being stripped of their hard-earned health benefits by an unscrupulous employer? Uh, speaker, I, I, thank, uh, I thank the member opposite uh, for bringing this issue uh, to my attention. Obviously, it seems like a, it's a matter between, the, between a union and its, uh, its employee, and I obviously encourage uh, the union and, and the employee to work together to be able to come to a, a, some sort of a settlement. We always encourage parties to uh, negotiate the th type of things around the negotiating table. That's where best results uh, are, are, are created. So I, I, encourage, uh, I encourage the company and the union to work together and be able to work, uh, work in agreement. If they need the assistance of the Ministry of uh, Labor uh, mediators, uh, we will provide those services uh, to facilitate uh, uh, an agreement. Yeah, Thank yeah. you, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Supplementary. Okay, we will call you. Uh, Minister, this isn't a, this isn't a one-off. This is just one of many stories of employers exploiting loopholes in federal and provincial law to deny workers wages and benefits that they are rightfully owed. In January, Virtus Communications in Fortier, and I know you're familiar with this, announced that it was shutting down, filing for bankruptcy in the States, and leaving 100 employees with no jobs and no severance. The callous treatment of workers such as those at Virtus and National Auto Rad is wrong and simply has to stop. When will this government finally take action to ensure that loyal workers like those in Windsor and Niagara get the wages and benefits that are rightfully theirs? Hey, speaker, the issues that the member speaks of are federal issues, and in fact, I have written to the federal minister of labour uh, to uh, to encourage her to ensure that they they enhance their worker protection uh, employment uh, protection program, the uh, wage earner protection program. Uh, you know, this is an issue that the federal government has to deal with to ensure uh, that in the in the matter of Virtus, which the member from Niagara Falls so aptly advocated for, and in this particular issue, uh, the federal government. Uh, uh, extend the wage earner protection uh, to those uh, who are beyond just uh, a bankruptcy uh, situation. I look forward to working with the member on this. I've written to the, uh, to the Minister of Labour federally, and I'll continue to urge her uh, to provide the protection that Ontario workers so much deserve. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you. And your question, the member for Glenbury, Prescott Russell. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Speaker, this is an important time of year for high school students across the province. Many have already uh, been accepted at post-secondary institutions for the coming fall term. Also, many students already in college or university have travelled home for the summer to be with their family and their friends. Ontario has world-class institutions across this province, and some students, like the ones in uh, my riding of Glengarry Prescott Russell, need to travel a distance to attend college and or university. Commuting from a great distance can be difficult, frustrating and at times time consuming. However, some students have no choice but to commute and I can understand the frustrations they face. Speaker, through you to the minister, can the minister inform the house about the opportunities Question. that post-secondary students have when they commute to school? Sir, training college and university. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And that, and that member is a strong voice for, for students across the province that, that do have long distances to travel to post-secondary education. And, and we're really proud of the fact that Ontario has the best colleges and universities in the world. Each and every student that's qualified should be free to choose which institution they'd like to attend, regardless of the distance. Ontario Distance Grants assist OSAP-eligible students from remote and rural Ontario areas with their transportation costs. The commuting grant provides $500 per term to students who commute on a regular basis, 80 kilometres or more, and there's no post-secondary institution near their home. The travel grant provides $300 a year to single dependent students who live away from home during the study period and their parents' home is 80 kilometres or more from the closest institution. Mr. Speaker, time with family and friends is important. Yes, Commuting can be a time-consuming and financially difficult. Our government is providing the tools to make this easier Thank for you. our students. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, for that great response uh, from the minister. It's great to see that our government is making post-secondary education more affordable and more accessible. Students in my riding of Glengarry Prescott Russell often study full-time, uh, Mr. Speaker, in French, and they have to travel to various colleges and universities across the province. Access to francophone studies is important to many students, and I speak uh, that I speak with, and are dedicated to pursuing their degrees in French. And I'm pleased to hear this, but once again, commuting and traveling to appropriate institutions can form a barrier for many students. Speaker, through you to the minister, could he provide us with an update on what the government is doing to assist francophone students who need to travel to college or university? Thank you, Minister. Speaker, this is a question that our minister responsible for francophone affairs speaks to me about very often. Francophone students deserve a supportive learning environment that allows them to study and succeed in their own language. We recognize the importance of providing francophone students in Ontario with a broader range of post-secondary options for study. Beginning in 2013-14, eligible francophone students who are attending full-time studies in French will be eligible for both the commuting grant and the travel grant, even if there is another institution closer to home. This expanded eligibility criteria supports accessibility of French language post-secondary studies in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to providing the best post-secondary education in the world. This grant is just one way that we're doing that. And I want to thank the Minister for Francophone Affairs for her continual championing of these important issues on behalf of Francophone Answer, students. Thank you. The question? The member from Perth, Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. The question is to the Premier. With your new tendering policy, your government is destroying independent school bus operators. Shortly after you became Premier, I wrote to your Education Minister to demand a change. I've sent countless emails for constituents whose livelihoods are at stake and met with the Minister of Rural Affairs. You ignored recommendations by former Integrity Commissioner Kohler Osborne, who said you got it wrong. He showed you a better, fair path, and you've lost a court case that said your decisions were wrong. Premier, how many court decisions will it take and how many lost jobs will it take before you admit your policy has failed? Here, here. Here, here. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. Uh, the, the member opposite has, is referring to an area which has is, is clearly been, been difficult. And because this has been a difficult area, we have met with both the Ontario school bus operators and also the uh, independent school bus operators because we now have a situation where there's uh, two competing organizations right, work, uh, representing operators. And what we have said to both both of those organizations is that we're willing to work with them and look at the procurement practices and make sure that the RFP practices are well refined, uh, that they are clear and that they're clear to everybody who is bidding. But I must make it clear that the Auditor General has Answer. given us direction that we do need to have a fair and open procurement process. Thank you, Supplementary, the member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 
Premier, if you were putting students first, you would be putting their safety first. Both the task force that Colter Osborne chaired and the Ontario Chamber of Commerce talked about the benefits of independent school bus operators. Like them, I know the best interests of our rural school communities are when local operators who know their student populations serve our schools. Right. Your actions prove you disagree with that. Will you put our students first and will you restore integrity in student transportation by letting our small, independent operators compete? Here, 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 here. Minister. Minister. Yes, thank you. Um, I repeat, we have met with Karen Cameron, representing the uh, independent school bus operators, and we've met with the, uh, uh, the Ontario School Bus Association, and we have said to both of them that we are willing to have a look at how the procurement policies are, are, uh, are, de are defined. But I think it is also important that we note that when we look at the data around who has been successful in procuring contracts, that contrary to uh, some of the reports we have heard, that the number of small operators has actually gone up. If you actually look at the experience Answer. across the province, the number of contracts that have gone to the smaller operators has actually increased. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, yesterday, scientist David Suzuki added his voice to the growing list of people critical of the Liberal government's plan to run diesel trains along the air rail link. Suzuki's concerns echo those of transit expert Joel Ann Vanderwagen, who recently called the Liberals' diesel plan, quote, the worst current example of wasted resources and opportunity. She calls electric train service, quote, a common sense alternative to create a GTA-wide rapid transit network now, not 30 years down the road. Speaker, will the minister admit that this diesel line is a bad plan and finally commit to immediate electrification of the Union Pearson Express? Minister Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, th thank you. Very, you know, Mr. Speaker, the, the more I listen to the third party, the more confused I am by their priorities. Um, big priority number one, make it cheaper to drive a car. Big priority number two, I don't understand because we both share a challenging set of constituencies along the Lakeshore line, where we're not running right now tier four diesel that is 25% of emissions. The trains that run along Ontario's tracks for the last, hundred, for the last 70 years have been diesel, Mr. Speaker. I don't understand, for, as, as someone who represents people who live half a block from the CN and CPR main lines where diesel is commonplace, that their health with conventional diesel seems to be a lower priority for the members when we've Answer. already committed to do electrification by 2017. When is one of the six new Democrats who represent people along the diesel-infested lines, as they might call them, going to do so? <clears throat> Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, you know, I just don't understand why this government would move ahead with more diesel transit investment at this point. Let's be very clear. As New Democrats, we believe in transit investment. We're committed to it. We know we need to pay for it in fair ways, but we also believe in smart transit investment. The Auditor General has criticized this government's diesel power plan. He says higher fares will drive down what he says are overly optimistic ridership projections on this line. Instead, an electrified line would allow multiple stops, it would generate higher ridership, it would be more affordable, and it would serve as a downtown relief line for the West End. Let's talk about this line, Minister. So, one last time, will the minister commit to do it once, to do it right the first time, and to electrify the Union Pearson Air Rail Link from day one? M Mr. Speaker, I'm going to say this very slowly. We are doing it. The EA is underway. It's for 2017. The e-environmental process doesn't allow us to do it now because it won't be ready for the Pan Am Games, which would be an embarrassment. And we're pretty proud of the Pan Am Games. Yeah, I'm still yeah. confused, Mr. Speaker. We could take $900 million right now out of what? 20 Northern Highways? How would that third party feel about that? Mr. Speaker, when is the third party going to demand 
in Ottawa here a national transit strategy? When are they going to show concern about getting conventional diesel on the CN and CPR lines electrified, which we can only do with the federal party? When will Mr. Beauclair say the word electrification uh, of a national transit policy? They had a chance when we were in power, Mr. Speaker, to support a national transit Thank policy, you. and they sided with the party there that cancelled it. Mr. Thank Speaker, electrification. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.